In this video, we will be looking at landing procedures in the Mirage 2000C, specifically those performed in instrument flight rules conditions. We will be utilizing the Mirage's instrument landing system, discuss how the APP approach mode differs when performing an ILS landing, use of the synthetic runway symbology on the heads-up display, how the autopilot can alleviate you of a lot of the work, and some possibilities of ILS landing when in emergency conditions. Hello fellow virtual aviators, we are back in the shapely and seductive Mirage 2000C and today we'll be looking at landing in what you can see are terrible weather conditions. You will have to take my word that we're over the Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf and there is a freak weather system resulting in cloud, rain and fog. We are wanting to land at Kassab in Oman, an airfield that is difficult to land at as it is but we are going to have to do this under instrument flight rules. Applied when visibility is poor and I cannot generally see where the aircraft is going. Now because I've been a very clever boy, I already have the location parameters for Kassab Airport programmed into my PCN navigation panel. As you can see there, I've got the latitude and longitude. I have the altitude of the runway. I have the true heading of the runway and the desired glide slope and I also have the route desired programmed at the same heading. All of this information is available from the F10 map or an airfield datasheet, which you can find online, and we discussed the programming of these parameters in our previous video. So let's select waypoint three as our destination waypoint to allow this information to interact with our flight instruments. Now for the procedure I'm going to show you, I am in a good position. If I take a look at the IDN or HSI, the horizontal situation indicator, which is this gauge here, it is telling me some useful information. Firstly, that my selected waypoint, which is the airfield, is east-northeast of me, which is indicated by the thick double-lined arrow. It is also telling me that I am just over 24 nautical miles from the waypoint, shown here on the numerical gauge. Just like in our visual flight rules landing, we are going to be using the route desired function. So let's switch that on. And you can see here that the waypoint is represented on the VTB heads down display by a plus, and the two parallel lines show our desired route. So I am in a good situation. I'm on the correct side of the airfield for the approach and I'm more than 10 nautical miles away. So when I know the approach is free from obstruction, the first thing I'm going to do is to descend to around about 2000 feet. Uh, I have my radar altimeter switched on, which is controlled by these two switches here, but I have also contacted Kassab International Airport and requested the QFE so I can calibrate my uh, altimeter. We've descended to approximately 2,000 feet and are now going to turn in and use the two vertical parallel lines on the hood uh, to guide us onto the radial of the runway. There they are. Let's line up. And we have to trust the Mirage. It will guide us to the correct runway radial. If you can't see these two parallel lines, make sure you have the route desired mode switched on on the PCA panel. I now need to prepare my navigation computer for an ILS, an instrument landing system landing. And I do this on this panel here, the VOR ILS panel. It's composed of two control knobs with two subcontrols and a frequency display. The subcontrol on the left knob controls power to the system. A stands for the French word arrête, which means off and M, the French word marché, which means on. The main control on the left-hand knob controls the pre-decimal part of the frequency, and the main control on the right-hand knob, the post-decimal part of the frequency. H, G, and B, D on the sub-control on the right are not required. They are just test modes. Now, the ILS landing system is a precision radio navigation system that will allow me to approach the runway precisely, even though I cannot see it. In order to do this, I need to tune to the ILS frequency of runway 19 at Kassab. I have looked this up and I know that it is 110.30 MHz, so let's tune to that. Superstitiously, I then switch the system off and back on again. 
ILS system on the ground at Kassab is essentially a highly directional radio beam that broadcasts along the radial of the runway. I need the ILS equipment in my aircraft to detect it. Using the route desired mode makes this easier, and I should pick it up around about 10 miles from the runway, hence why I need to keep my distance until I get on to the runway radial. On the typical glide slope of 3 degrees, at 10 miles this is normally at around about 3,000 feet, so as long as I'm slightly below that, I should pick it up. Now I prefer, just to be a little bit lower, I prefer 2,000 feet. Our route desired marker on the hood has shifted to the right, so let's chase that to get onto the runway radial. I can also use the symbology on the VTB heads down display to help me gauge the correct heading. I am now going to fly this heading and maintain this altitude until I'm approximately 10 nautical miles away from the waypoint. Okay, I am just over 10 nautical miles from the waypoint and I'm going to switch over to APP approach mode. At this point I'm also going to drop my gear so that I don't need to think about it later on. Now my ILS system has captured what is called the localizer. This is the radio beam that tells me the radial of the runway even though I can't see it. And this is represented by this dashed line here. We also have this symbol here, this is our ILS steering cue, and we want to place our velocity vector indicator on there to steer onto the correct radial. This is also given on this instrument here, our primary attitude director indicator, and is represented by the two yellow lines. At the center, the dot represents our aircraft, and we need to steer the aircraft in such a way as to bring these yellow lines to intersect with the central dot. The yellow lines will intersect the center if we are on the correct glide slope and runway heading. Using the hood symbology is significantly easier, so I'm going to steer my aircraft so that my velocity vector icon lines up with my ILS steering cue. I'm going to maintain this altitude until I pick up the second component of the ILS radio beam, the glide slope. I know I have detected the glide slope as the symbology has changed once again. My steering cue has now changed to a square instead of a U shape. And I also have this synthetic virtual runway representation on the localizer beam. So even though I can't see it, I now know where the runway is. Now it's not 100% accurate, it's just a guide, so please do bear that in mind. In this landing, we are going to utilize the Mirage's awesome autopilot, and we're going to switch it on with these two switches here. Firstly, the autopilot master control to switch the system on. Secondly, the autopilot localizer and glide slope selector. I recommend you have these bound to a key or a switch on your keyboard or HOTAS. So press autopilot master control, and localizer and glide slope selector. And you'll see that immediately the velocity vector icon has lined itself up with the steering cue. The aircraft's flyby wire system will now steer you to the perfect approach on the runway. The only thing it doesn't control is the throttle. So we have to monitor that as we approach. So let's throttle up. Just like a regular landing, we're going to get our uh, acceleration chevrons lined up with our angle at attack brackets and the Mirage itself will make tiny adjustments to ensure that the velocity vector icon and the glide slope all line up together. Oh, a little bit too much, so let's bring that throttle down. So I'm completely hands off stick now, all I'm uh, controlling is the throttle. Everything's looking good, I'm just under 5 nautical miles to go and just under an altitude of 1300 feet. As an additional guidance, you can see that the yellow lines are beginning to line up on the primary ADI.
three nautical miles to go and just under 900 feet. You can see the synthetic runway beginning to become a little bit more apparent. Now the autopilot will not land the plane itself, you have to do that. So at around about 100 feet, I'm going to disengage the autopilot system. And as usual, at around about just below 50 feet, I will apply my flare and see if we can bring it down nice and safely. To disengage the autopilot, simply press the autopilot master control switch one more time. Just over one nautical mile to go, our radar altimeter should appear in the center of the hood. There it is. Just going to monitor that. Disengage autopilot at 100. At about 50 feet, apply the flare. And bring her down as normal. Maintain that high angle of attack for some aero braking. And let's deploy the chute. Cup of tea, please. Now, you don't have to use the autopilot function. You can fly the Mirage manually. All you need to do is, again, steer the aircraft so that the velocity vector indicator lines up with your steering cue square. This just means you've got one more thing to think about. It's not just the throttle, it's also the attitude of the aircraft. If you're finding the heads-up display gets a little bit too cluttered, you can switch off the synthetic runway symbology with the magic slave button, which again I recommend you bind to a key or switch. So we'll do that on this approach here. A manual landing, Switch off the synthetic runway, and we're down. In this final example, we are going to simulate the failure of the heads up and heads down displays. This means that we're going to have to use our steam gauges, our manual instruments, to try and set her down. Now this is exceedingly difficult to do. I have contacted Kassab by radio to get the QFE barometric pressure at the airfield and have tuned my altimeter to it. I've also managed to get myself into a position where I'm just over 10 miles off the threshold of the runway and the runway heading and my heading are coinciding. So we can see that on the HSI. I know that it's runway 19, which has a heading of 194, and my heading arrow is roughly pointing in the right direction. My INS system is still functioning, so the distance information on the HSI is correct. In order to achieve the correct approach, I am going to have to rely on my primary ADI here and fly the plane so that the yellow indicator needles line up in the center with my aircraft. Easier said than done. At the same time, I'm going to have to monitor my airspeed indicator, my altimeter, my vertical speed indicator or variometer, and also my angle of attack gauge. So lots to think about, lots to concentrate on as we attempt to land the aircraft. And just to add insult to injury, that alarm you just heard was the bingo fuel warning. So we're going to use the control stick to chase the yellow markers on the ADI, try and bring those into a position. At the same time, I'm going to keep an eye on the HSI to make sure that I'm flying roughly in the right direction. Yellow needles on the ADI are looking not too bad. We'll keep on flying this, chasing just to the left. Get her back on the localizer. And descend slightly as I've lost the glide slope. Thankfully visibility is a little bit better here, so hopefully we'll be able to see the runway at some point. Terrible, absolutely terrible that was. I was all over the place, but I've just spotted the 
Pappy approach lights on the threshold of the runway, so I'm going to try and put her down anyway, so wish me luck. Well, a wise man once told me that any landing you can walk away from was a good landing. Well, as ever, I hope that was useful for you. Let me know how you get on landing in terrible weather conditions. Feel free to do the usual thing, like, subscribe, comment and share. But until next time, virtual aviators, I look forward to seeing you online in the skies. This is Reaver saying, last call.